वेलकम एवरीवन टू द सेशन बिल्डिंग रेजिलियंट सिक्योरिटी लॉग पाइपलाइंस विद केयर्स बाय प्रीमा विरानी सो वी आर ग्लैड दे कैन जॉइन अस टुडे सो विदाउट फर्दर डिले ओवर टू योर प्रीमा हाय एवरीवन um so in today's session i'm going to talk about the popular practice of chaos engineering and how um you know security team can potentially benefit from it um and i think i'll just dive straight into it um i hope you enjoy this presentation as much as you know i have enjoyed researching it and thinking about it and planning for the experiment so um here we go let's talk about the status quo that um is you know prevalent in the security industry today um in today's session i'm going to talk about chaos engineering specifically in the context of um security log pipelines um because you know log pipelines are basically the building blocks of a, a robust uh, incident detection and response infrastructure and um a lot can go wrong with them as we build them as we buy them sometimes as well and um in today's session i'm going to talk about how we can uh, uh, potentially make them more resilient and more robust with chaos engineering so the status quo the status quo is as i mentioned earlier um that blue teams are highly reliant on quality of their logs for good detections and log pipelines are often built without reliability considerations so what this means in you know the real world scenario is that um let's say if you know uh, we uh, the security team that's trying to respond to an incident um ends up finding out at the last minute that um the logs that they wanted to you know dig through in order to identify where the incident started from or how it's progressing further uh, because the logs aren't available they aren't able to dig deeper into it and um are you know blocked significantly log pipelines are often built without reliability considerations as well um it's literally purely built for functionality a lot of the times and um quality assurance and reliability generally kind of you know becomes an afterthought which is kind of funny and ironic because um with you know gen- regular development practices the problem seems to be slightly like of the opposite nature where it's security that's kind of coming in as an afterthought and uh, reliability and so on are you know generally uh, kind of very well thought of in the design process um so yeah as we know it a lot of these log pipelines are often built with really fragile glue code and um it tends to have multiple single points of failures so um, that's you know uh, that those that's how security pipelines are built today as we know it in a lot of companies cases especially uh, this you know turns out to be true uh, when it's come it, it comes down to small and medium sized enterprises that don't necessarily have as many resources to dedicate to you know security in general let alone um the um, uh, uh, development part of it so it tends to get very challenging now imagine it's a monday morning you know and um um the, the as a security person you find out that your employees laptops are locked with ransomware and um um the list of affected employees is getting bigger you know as time passes and the impact is huge the business you know critical business systems um are down uh, there is absolutely no productivity whatsoever and um, um the log collection on which you were relying in order to identify where this issue started from uh, and or you know any other trails that uh, you might need to uh, sniff um you aren't able to do that suddenly because the log collection on the specific uh, parts of the infrastructure that you're trying to examine the log collection there had stopped about 2 weeks ago which the security team didn't know about and just imagine the kind of chaos that this would you know introduce um within the company within the security team particularly because um suddenly you know you aren't able to investigate into an incident that as a security team we are expected to you know both mitigate and um investigate uh, to identify and uncover the full story 
So what are some of the challenges? Um, the log pipelines are built just for functionality, robustnesses, often ignored. Lack of incentives for the engineers to build for, uh, build for robustness. And this turns out to be you know, particularly true in security teams because, as I mentioned earlier, the teams tend to be very small um, and there, there's usually you know, a lot to do um, for a really lean team where you know even the start other standard security initiatives tend to get deprioritized um, in light of you know something that's more critical. This especially becomes a challenge when there's uh, there are burning fires all the time, and you know that tends to happen a lot if the company is dealing with financial data, healthcare information, or personally identifiable information, especially with financial data. Um, because the target is very lucrative and there are, you know, at all times, uh, there's someone or another trying to get a uh, hold of this, um, these financial assets and um, are trying to exploit the systems. In which case, if the overall security uh, posture of the company is not very mature, then, you know, it, uh, it, it can be, um, it, uh, the situation can be like, you know, burning fires every other week or something. And uh, each one of these incidents can be so time consuming that uh, you're so uh, focused on the short term and trying to put out the fire that's currently burning that, you know, planning for the long term becomes difficult. Even if you have planned for the long term to stick to the plan becomes, you know, equally as difficult as well. So there tends to be a you know lack of incentives for engineers to build for robustness, robustness for exactly this reason because as it is there's so little time to build uh, whatever you are building as a security engineer uh, needs to be functional for sure but then as as soon as everybody knows that this works uh, it kind of becomes secondary to you know iterate further on it and uh, make sure that it's reliable. Um, like, you know, your regular software uh, would be, uh, commercial software would be. And then every device and service is a special snowflake. So anybody who has, you know, dealt with um, uh, the this challenge of log collection knows how uh, sometimes in order to collect logs from, say, 10 different systems, you need to write 10 different solutions, or even if not 10 different solutions, maybe seven or eight different solutions at least. There's very little that can be kind of rinsed and repeated. Um, unfortunately, that is because a lot of the logs that we are trying to collect in these scenarios are on third, uh, they're logs from third party infrastructure. So some logs that you're trying to collect are from Duo, for example, that's your multi-factor authentication provider. Some logs are from, say, Okta or One Login, that's your SSO provider. Um, some logs are from Amazon, and then um, a lot of your logs are from um, your internal um, infrastructure. If you have like a combination of AWS and bare metal, um, some of your logs are also from your bare metal infrastructure. You know, and all these three four systems have a different way um, in which you can aggregate logs from it. So for example, from Duo or Okta, uh, you, you might need to write uh, your own um, you know, scripts in order to fetch these logs from the third party APIs. Um, all these APIs have a different mechanism for authentication, a, diff a, a very different schema of the way the logs are structured as well. So um, if you are you know, working with a language like Golang or something, then you might need to write structs for um, every single type of log that you're trying to collect and so on. And then when it comes down to you know, your regular kind of uh, infrastructure logs from uh, your Linux servers and so on, um, they tend to, um, you know, you, uh, for teams um, to be able to collect them, you need to use uh, syslog forwarding agents, uh, agent like rsyslog or something like that. And, you know, each one of these uh, systems, uh, ultimately, uh, you're trying to collect all of these logs in one single place, ideally, um, which is your seam solution as a security team. But every single one of them has um, different kind of nodes and hops through which it gets to the scene. And, you know, that's where it becomes very challenging to keep an eye out on every single one of those streams and every single one of those choke points where it could potentially fail, uh, where it could potentially be leaking in some uh, cases. 
uh, or you know have temporary disruptions and so on. So um, again, every device and service is a special snowflake of its own, and to be able to collect logs from each uh, one of those uh, tends to be um, you know kind of methodology of its own. Um, so yeah. So we've talked enough about the challenges and the status quo here. Now let's you know dive a little bit into uh, what can be some of the solutions um, to try and make sure that the security lock pipelines are um, um, resilient and non-disruptive at all times. Uh, one of the you know most basic uh, basics of the solutions are monitoring and alerting on lock spikes and dips. So this, um, you know, monitoring for any uh, time at which um, there are drops of log packets. So for example, if you're trying to aggregate logs from Okta into your seam, um, it might make a lot of sense. It would make a lot of sense to um, a monitor for uh, um, basically no logs coming in for uh, say more than 10 minutes um, because, you know, um, a mechanism like, uh, Okta, for example, uh, can be, uh, again, you know, you can introduce more creative ways of monitoring there as well. So uh, when it's the regular working hours, the nine to fives, um, during those times, uh, the traffic would be so high that um, in even, you know, 10 minutes of quietness might indicate there's something off. However, on evenings on weekends, um, you might not see as much authentication activity. And so, you know, it might make more sense to uh, monitor if there are any log drops or uh, absence of logs for uh, more than half an hour or more than, you know, an hour. And um, introducing, you know, um, kind of appropriate windows like that um, so that you're also, you know, not flooded with false positives. Um, that is really important to monitor uh, whenever there are log drops. And then sanity check your alert configurations, because sometimes what happens is uh, the systems that are trying to send uh, the alerts about the log spikes or the log drops, those systems themselves uh, can be down. And if the alerts are not being sent out as expected, then you know that, that's another kind of range of uh, problems right there where uh, you can just never be sure if um, even the monitoring that you've implemented is um, going to be accurate um, and up to date at all times. Um, so it's always a good idea to sanity check alert configurations for this reason. And involve DevOps and quality assurance in dev practices. Um, this you know, is one of the more obvious solutions out there, but I also understand that this can be challenging to implement, especially uh, because it can be difficult to pull in resources from, you know, what tend to be um, kind of similarly lean teams, right? DevOps and QA are never really massive teams in most companies, in most small and uh, small to medium sized enterprises. So uh, where possible involve DevOps and q and in dev practices, but I wouldn't say that that's always feasible. And sometimes, you know, something as simple as um, involving the uh, DevOps teams and kind of laying out that foundational groundwork um, of best practices um, is also very useful. Uh, once they have laid that out, uh, it can, you know, the owners can then be on the security team to follow those practices that are agreed upon, that are recommended, and that are laid out uh, by the experts. Um, in this particular uh, scenario. But of course, you know, all these are uh, barely scratching the surface and um, th uh, these solutions are nearly not enough. And that's where we talk about chaos engineering and how, you know, chaos engineering can come in handy um, in this particular situation. So chaos engineering, as most of you would know, is this uh, empirical and experimental uh, approach that addresses um, uh, uh, chaos in distributed systems at scale. So um, uh, this is a method where um, as a uh, you know, blue team or as a uh, defender team, uh, we're trying to introduce controlled and planned failures uh, within our own infrastructure at different intervals of times. And um, then uh, what we do is we observe the failures uh, that uh, in addition to the failures that we've 
uh, actually ingested and introduced ourselves. There could be failures that um, were caused by the knock-on effects of the failures that we intentionally, you know, uh, introduced. So there could be unintentional consequences of intentional actions. Uh, and that, you know, is something that tends to happen a lot in a uh, real, you know, production environment or in a uh, real dev test fraud environment, any of those. Um, to observe failures caused by knock-on effects is very important for that reason. And then, you know, of course, observing something uh, fail gives us a well-defined problem uh, where we can actually sit down and pinpoint exactly what's failing and exactly why it's failing. Um, and then we can, you know, start uh, devising strategies for how to mitigate those failures, how to address them in the best way possible. Um, and then, you know, there are so many tools available out there um, in the, you know, open source at the moment, as well as well as some commercial offerings as well, uh, which I can talk about, you know, a little later. One of these tools, one of those tools is um, Chaos Monkey or Siminami, as um, it's been developed by Netflix. Netflix has been, um, as most of you would know, uh, on the forefront of developing the chaos methods. And um, a lot of what I'm talking about today is, in fact, inspired by um, the book that's uh, written by them and published by them, the O'Reilly book on chaos engineering. And um, I highly recommend reading um, that as well. Um, when it comes down to you know security, um, particularly, um, where we can, you know, really benefit from these. I can give you some examples of, um, you know, the kind of scenarios in which um, the chaos methods might be very useful. So one of those scenarios is, um, let's say you're collecting logs from one uh, application that has four different services. Now you are monitoring for when the um, application logs fail uh, completely, but you're not necessarily able to monitor for when the particular service logs uh, that are coming from that uh, particular application fails. So, uh, for example, if you have, say, application logs, authentication logs, uh, and network logs uh, coming from this one um, app, app um, and all these three logs are kind of, you know, uh, divided in its um, own ways, they uh, come through with different tags and different labels and so on. Um, it might be very, it might be a good idea to um, uh, first of all monitor for failures on one of those three streams instead of just um, uh, observing for failures on the entire kind of fire hose. And um, um, in this similar fashion, it might be very interesting to uh, inject failures into one of those three uh, streams and try and see what happens when the failure is injected. Is it affecting the two other streams that, um, I, um, you know, that we thought shouldn't be reliant on this one stream, but um, somehow turns out to be reliant on it and um, if one goes down, all three end up going down. And if then if that happens, then you know you know that uh, that is one kind of single point of failure right there, which uh, you might need to address. So you might need to address it with the third party whose applications um, you're trying to you know collect the logs from and so on. So you know that's kind of one of the examples of how the chaos methods can be applied to um, the log pipelines and the logging infrastructure uh, as we know it today. And of course, you know, just like any methodology or any system, um, there's no uh, such thing as a silver bullet. There are going to be limitations of every approach um, that we take at all times. Um, and, you know, some of the limitations that we must discuss here are uh, around, you know, understanding of chaos engineering, uh, the kind of, uh, what do you call it, the philosophy behind it is uh, understanding that philosophy is very important um, because a lot of people mistake chaos engineering for uh, the art of breaking. I'd say, yes, it's the art of breaking, but it's not only the art of breaking. It, more than the art of breaking, it's the art of observing. Um, so, you know, never, uh, first of all, never run a chaos experiment that you already expect to fail, uh, because that's kind of counterintuitive, right? Um, chaos engineering is something that's um, that should be used as um, 
discovery method more than anything else. So on systems that you think you know um, work in a particular way and you're very, you know, you have high confidence in them uh, working that way, it can be very useful to uh, introduce chaos experiments there instead because those are the systems that may surprise you, you know. And um, that's where you will actually get something out of the experiments that you've run. Because the systems that you know and uh, you know will fail and you know exactly how they'll fail, you don't really have that kind of need for discovery there. And to kind of, you know, um, make them fail or make them break just for the sake of it uh, doesn't really make sense. Um, again, it's futile without appropriate monitoring in place. Because unless you can observe um, your experiment and the knock-on effects of your experiment, um, you can't really, I mean, uh, the whole point is discovery, right? So you can't um, discover what you can't even see. Um, and, you know, that is a very important thing to remember and keep in mind. Um, again, this is an approach because it involves breaking. Um, it requires higher risk appetite from security teams. And, you know, also the understanding that uh, introducing chaos into your system doesn't mean they will always invariably fail, but also accepting and understanding that they very much can fail. Um, and, you know, that of course requires a higher risk appetite than usual from the security team. So this is something that would work really well for a security team that has a high level of maturity in its program already. The you know basics are already done. Um, and um, then you know it's um, just a matter of kind of introducing more maturity. Um, teams like those would benefit highly from it versus you know teams that are still uh, in their nascent stage uh, that don't even have the you know the bare bones groundwork laid out uh, of logging and monitoring and alerting. Um, again, uh, for the exact same reasons, it would be difficult to justify chaos experiments in a small team, a uh, small security team. Um, and, you know, for this exact reason, a lot of what I'm talking about for myself is still very much on paper still. Um, there are companies out there that are, um, uh, that have found this uh, idea useful and interesting enough that they've taken it up uh, um, and, you know, st they've started to develop um, uh, basically commercial offering around it and so on. But uh, personally, I haven't had uh, the opportunity to really play with it uh, or go, you know, all out with chaos engineering uh, within the uh, infrastructure and the environments that I've been a part of because of late I've been a part of a lot of startups with very small and, uh, um, you know, nascent security teams in their early stages. Um, in addition to introducing, you know, chaos to the log pipelines, I'd also suggest and recommend uh, potentially introducing them into your alerting pipelines as well. Um, because, yeah, again, you know, what tends to happen is um, as the um, uh, alerting infrastructure of a security team starts to mature, there's a lot of uh, alerting and um, um, sorry, uh, not only alerting, but alerting and response would both benefit from chaos experiments. And as the teams start to mature, um, there's you know a lot of um, incident response automation that starts to get introduced to the ecosystem because the security engineers don't want to be sitting there, you know, repeatedly manually be answering or uh, commenting on the exact same types of incidents um, every single time. And for that reason, um, you know, the teams might benefit a lot from automating parts of them away uh, that um, the team already knows, uh, follows, uh, you know, set uh, number of steps or set procedures. And while automation is being introduced there, of course, every time you try to automate something, it introduces uh, it introduces its own kind of, you know, different level of complexity there as well, and a whole range of unknown unknowns. So, you know, every time um, automations are introduced, um, it might be beneficial to introduce chaos uh, in the, you know, testing methodologies of those things as well. So, yeah, that's, I think, my deck for today. Um,
in conclusion, let's join the chaos. Let's try and um, make you know these um, experiments come alive as much as possible by leveraging the uh, existing frameworks and the existing tools that are already out there in the market. Um, let's also you know uh, explore. I mean, there are a bunch of offerings as I mentioned earlier out in the market. Uh, if you if you just Google chaos engineering, you'd find a whole lot of um, both open source and commercial offerings, uh, and also commercial offerings that have like a freemium, um, a free premium, uh, a free uh, basic version that we can download and you know run experiments on. It would also make a lot of sense to uh, set up you know lab environment to run these experiments um, before running them in a production uh, or any sort of you know dev test or prod um, environments in uh, in an actively you know, engage and run company. Um, and of course, I would like to, you know, shout out to Aaron Reinhardt, Tammy Buto, and Nora, um, whose research and whose uh, work in this area has inspired a lot of my thoughts and ideas that um, I discussed today. So that is, uh, and oh yeah, I'm on Twitter if you'd like to uh, join the conversation. Um, we can always, you know, connect on Twitter and have some interesting discussions. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. This was my talk today, and I hope you found it useful. Uh, thanks, Prima, for sharing your experience with us today. Cool, thank you so much.